Good evening. Good evening. It's my privilege, thrill, and honor to be here with everyone tonight. It's been about two years since we've been here. It's always wonderful to come, and what's always neat is we also get to meet new family members in the church. You know, some faces here are ones we've known for years, and we get to meet new ones, and that's always, always a thrill. So I want to thank Brother G.J. for asking me to, to um, share from God's Word with you tonight. My text, as many of you know, because I kept being asked, is Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. And I, I came across this verse because we learned a song... And the song is, the author of the song derived the song from this passage. And it really stuck out to me as, as I read it. And it's like, you know, there, there's so much here. There's such an exhortation here to us as believers. And it says, thus says the Lord. This is the Lord speaking. He says, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And so we're not focusing on that last sentence where they refused to to walk in, but what I want to talk about this morning, what I want to look at tonight, is the exhortation that we are to stand in the ways, to see and to ask, but to look for the old ways. That word stand in the ways there. It's referring to, we're going to see a metaphor, we're going to see a word picture here, but it's saying where the paths converge, where the paths converge, and as as we're going through and we develop this metaphor, in other words, it's saying don't keep walking if you don't know where you're going. It says stand in the way, stand in the roads where the paths come together, okay? And then it says to see and to ask, that is to make inquiries, consider what you see and you hear, see and ask. Now, of course, men are often stereotyped as not willing to do this, but spiritually, we all need to be willing to see and to ask. So here's, here's what this metaphor, here is the picture that the Lord is, is portraying for us through the prophet Jeremiah. It's that of a traveler who's on his way to a particular city. And when I, when I read this, I think of the book Pilgrim's Progress. You know, it's a traveler. He's on his way. But he comes to a place where the road separates. There's several paths. He's not sure. He can't tell. You know, for those that that, have ever been around cattle or or even in in game, sometimes you can tell a trail because it's what's used. And if you're looking for water, follow the one that's worn. If you find it, a cow trail, an animal trail, whatever it is. But sometimes we can't tell, it's not evident what the path is. So he's saying, when you come to this place, you don't know where to go. Don't keep walking. He's he's afraid of going astray. This this picture we have, he doesn't want to go the wrong way. He doesn't know the direction, so he stops. He is trying to figure out which way he, he should go. And at last, as he's waiting and looking and trying to figure it out, there comes another traveler, or maybe travelers, he asks him, what is the correct road? He finds the direction he's to go, and he continues on his journey. As he arrives at his destination, there is rest from his travels. Amen. And that is the exhortation that, that God is giving the Jews to, uh, then, but also applies to us today. We are to seek the old paths. Seek the way that is tried and true, that is known. And as we go into this, when we, when we say seek the old paths, we're not saying seek the cultures of, of 1910 or 1920 or 1970, because cultures do change. But there are principles that transcend all cultures that apply to us today. So as, as we consider this, The first point that we want to consider 
is inquiring for the right path, we must seek out the way of God. We must seek out the way of God. And a couple passages, first turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 32. And as we go, uh, as we go through here today, we're going to be looking at both Old and New Testament because I want us to see and develop and understand that God's way has not changed. His ceremonial laws have changed, yes. But God's way has not changed. And I, I hope to develop that in such a way that it, it becomes evident for us. But in Acts chapter 32 and in verse 7, he says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Notice, ask your father and he will show you. Your elders and they will tell you. Ask who? Don't ask your, it doesn't say ask your peers. Now, if you have a, a righteous peer, is it wrong to, to ask peers questions? But, but who's it referring to? It's talking to those who had the wisdom and the knowledge. The elders. We're, but, but notice how, again, the instruction is seek and ask. Ask them. Ask them. And then um, Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Notice Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Now, this is a passage, and a lot of these passages we read, you can actually develop sermons and concepts in and of themselves. And this is a passage that's always referred to. But notice here, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness, and they, scripts the, or they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Amen. They didn't take blindly what was told to them. And that's part of the seeking and asking. It's making inquiries. It's using discernment. It's using um, thinking. But they search the scriptures. Yes, does this add up? Does this make the point? But notice that they were inquiring. They were inquisitive. And what, what's, what's, uh, what's really neat in this passage, it's kind of a, a side thought, but I always used to think of this as their fair-mindedness being the fact that they searched the Scriptures. But what made them fair-minded was that they received the Word of God, that they were willing to receive the Word of God. And so here we see that this, this way that we are to seek, or I want to look at um, this, this way we are to seek, what is it? So, you know, we mentioned it, we've looked at it. Well, it is simply... Put the word of God. Amen. It, is sim it is as simple as God's word that all of us are holding today. That is what we are to be seeking. And we see this in another common passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3. A passage that bears out probably the, the clearest, um, the clearest way that we can what God's word is useful for. And in chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, he says, And that from the childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make you, what? Wise, Wise for salvation, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And although Jeremiah 6, 16 didn't use the word salvation, what is rest for your souls that was promised? Salvation. That's salvation. That rest that he promised, that is salvation. He says, and from childhood... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. And so, clearly, we see we are to be seeking God's way, His way. And we're going to get into more what that is, but as we're building this point, why, why is God constantly exhorting? Why did He constantly exhort the Jews? I think from what I understand, it was about every 40 years they would stray. They would go back, they, you know, 40 years, that's one generation. 
they would go to worshiping other gods. God would bring them back and tell them, don't leave or I'm going to harm you again. I'm going to bring judgment on you again. And they would leave. And then, you know, the next generation, they'd come back because, you know, they, they saw what happened and what God did for them. And so constantly we are exhorted to seek those old paths. Constantly we are exhorted to, to follow after the word of God. And, and the, the reason that is, is because this way is not natural to mankind. This way isn't what comes natural for us. What comes natural for us is the, the, the life we lived before we knew the Lord. The pleasures, the, whether there was substance abuse or just simply living for yourself and whatever pleasure came. You know, there's a lot of sober people who are still lost on Judgment Day. They could have at least had fun, you know, getting there is, is the, the concept, you know. But there's a lot of people who live good lives, people that we know that we'd say, They're a, that's a good person, but they reject the blood of Christ. Why? Because it's not natural to mankind. It isn't the way that we naturally want to go. It's not what we automatically desire and think of. And as we go back to Jeremiah, I'm sure many of you can quote this passage, but in chapter 10 and verse 23, Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, God puts it so simply for us. If we would simply just look to his word, you know, all of our questions can be answered. You know, the whys that we ask a lot of times, why, why do I struggle with this? Why is this the case? God's word answers those questions. And here's one of them. Why do I always make the wrong decisions? Because you're making them. You're not letting God make them for you. And verse 23, it says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Amen. This is why we're constantly reminded to turn back to the word of God, to turn back to seek his counsel, to seek the counsel of our elders, to seek the counsel of those that are faithful in the Lord. Why? And, and if we're seeking the counsel of someone faithful in the Lord, whose counsel are we getting? We're getting God's counsel. We're getting the Lord's counsel. But the way of man, and I remember this verse from many, many years ago, and my dad preaching on it, and, and it's, it stuck with me. The way of man is not in himself. Anyone who thinks that they have the intelligence, the, the mental fortitude, or even the intestinal fortitude to guide themselves would be calling God a liar. Because he said, it's not in you to direct your own steps. Amen. And we see this also in uh, Psalms chapter 37 from a little bit of a different angle. But David, and again, there's so many passages, so many correlating verses we can read. But in Psalms chapter 37 and verse 23, David said, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Amen. So if our steps are good, if we are righteous, if someone comes to us and says, we appreciate your, your, um, your example and your stand for the Lord, who's to, which way are you following? Well, God's steps, because he ordered that way. It wasn't on us. The fact is that Um, this way, our flesh is at odds with our natural man. It's at 100% odds with our natural man. And I believe Paul brings this out um, the clearest for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you would turn with me there. And we're going to read... Verses, uh, uh, we'll read verse 12 through 16. Now we have not received the spirit of the world, 
but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Uh, and actually, I want you to drop down to verse 14. Now, we'll skip 13. It says, But the natural man, notice, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of of Christ. Now, I wanted to read a little bit more of the context, but the main verse we're picking out here says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Notice it says, they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. He doesn't understand. When we try to witness to someone who has no amount of or any, any spiritual thoughts in them or interest in them, it can't be understood. It can't be understood. Notice how opposed it is to the things of God. It is opposed to the things of God. And, and one thing I like is the older I get, the more I, I study, the more I see so many of these verses, the, the Word of God, there's so many individual verses that allow us to self-examine. You know, we, we talk about examining ourselves before the Lord's Supper. But there's so many verses that give us the opportunity to examine ourselves on a daily basis. Amen. And we can, if we're refusing to hear instruction from Brother Fernie, here's a verse to examine yourself. Am I not accepting something that's spiritual because I'm carnal? Or from another spiritual brother, a spiritual sister. Maybe there's, maybe there's a spiritual, an older sister that, that tries to exhort you. Uh, uh, you know, a younger woman about how to train a child, that a child needs discipline. If we refuse that, it's in the Word of God. It's spiritual, scriptural advice. You know, are we yet carnal? And that was what Paul kept telling them. Are ye not yet carnal? Are ye not yet carnal? And so this way, this way that, that Christ, that, that God desires us to turn to, and he uses, he uses, in the Old Testament, he used prophets as his mouthpiece. Today he uses the word of God. Today he uses preachers and teachers and elders. Today he uses godly parents. He uses anyone who is willing to speak the truth. Amen. Are we willing to seek that way? Are we willing to actually stop and ponder the direction, the road? Amen. This is the exhortation to us from the Scriptures. The second point that we want to look at and consider as we go through these is that the way spoken of here, as we mentioned it, it is eternal. It is eternal. The word used there that says stand and seek for the old paths, that word means of long duration, of antiquity, depending how it's used, futurity, forever, ever, everlasting, evermore, perpetual, old, ancient. All synonyms can be used. So it is eternal. It is forever. It is of old, and it is yet in the future. You know, and I don't have the verse, but we, we understand the Scriptures teach us that God is the day, same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's not going to change. Neither is His will for mankind. Neither is His will for mankind. The path that the child of God is to be following is not new. It's from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. It is the path of righteousness and the path of holiness. Amen. This is the path that God desires of His children. Amen. That He desires from you and I. The Apostle Paul spoke of this to Felix. Notice Acts chapter 24 and, and verse uh, 25. Acts 24 and verse 25. And, and just one passage that we're going to take out, but we all know the story. The Apostle Paul never let an opportunity to witness go to waste, did he? He never let an opportunity. His, his, entire, his entire defense... 
like, hey, hold on, Felix. I got to start at the beginning. We're not going to start when I just got, you know, assaulted by the Jews in the temple and what they're accusing me of there. He preached the gospel. And in Acts chapter uh, 24 and verse 25, notice it says, Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. But the part we wanted there, notice Paul reasoned of righteousness. Judgment, I believe some, or uh, uh, self-control. Some verses read mercy and judgment to come. This is the old way. Righteousness. What does the word righteous mean? The easiest way I can make it explainable to us is living in a way that is right before God. If God says this is the way, then it is righteous. And so Paul reasoned with Felix of righteousness, judgment, and of self-control. I want to look at, and again, we can, we can go on for a long time with what all would be entailed as the old way. But I have three, three different um, principles that I'd like to examine and expound on a little bit tonight that consist or are found or make up, at least in part. These are blanket umbrellas that make up the old way. And the first one is the scriptures, the old way, teaches that we are to stay away from evil. Stay away from that which is evil. Now, let's go over to Exodus chapter 23. Exodus chapter 23 and verse uh, 7. Exodus 23 and verse 7. And just as I'm pulling out a couple verses here and there throughout the, uh, the, the Old and the New Testament, understand that this is a drop in the bucket, especially under the Old Testament. God's instructions on staying away from evil and staying away from that which is wicked is endless. He says, keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I will justify, for I will not justify the wicked. Amen. Keep yourself far from a false matter. And time and time again we read, God said, don't go near those um, idolaters, lest what? You intermingle. Your sons find their women beautiful, and they marry, and, turn their, and they shall turn their hearts away from the Lord their God. It was stay away. It wasn't don't play with it, don't, don't be okay with it. It was stay away Amen. from that which is evil. Amen. And as we go through this point, I can tell you that I am convicted greatly of this point because I think we're so surrounded by evil it often doesn't bother us like it should. We can become desensitized to it. But are we seeking the right way? Are we seeking to be on God's side? Or are we comfortable with it? The scriptures are going to tell us and tell us to stay away from it. Notice, turn with me if you would over to Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. Romans chapter 12 and verse 9. If my memory serves me correctly, we read this passage this morning. Romans 12 and verse 9. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Notice, here's the part we want. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. If you would look up, there's two words in, in this passage that are key. And I, on, when I study, I like, and I know Brother Jay does and most preachers do, they look at the Greek word. Because we lose sight or maybe we don't use that word. I don't use the word abhor, you know, in my <laughs> daily language. Well, what? Well, you know what? It's a very intense word. It's a very strong word with a lot of meaning. 
That word means to have a horror of something. It means to detest something, but, you know, and I, I never, even when I was straying, I never really cared for horror films. I've seen a couple, but not the scariest ones. You know why? Because something can come out and it actually, you know, terrifies you. Have bad dreams, whatever it is. Some people get kicks out of that. I don't understand it. But um, horror films. Imagine that sentiment concerning sin. Because that's what this word means. Do we have a horror of the things that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross? Amen. Including our sins. Do we have a horror of that? My sins nailed Jesus to the cross. Is that something that I'm in horror of? Or is that something I, I brag about by giving my testimony? Are we in horror of our sins? And as, as strong as that word is, I love this other word. He says to cling or to, I believe the King James used the word cleave. To cling to that which is good. As strong as the word is to, to be terrified and separate yourself from something, is as strong as this word is to that which is good. Amen. To that which is good. I don't know, in, in, my, in my trade, uh, often there, there's, there's a lot of bonding and unions that happen through materials. One, one uh, process is called vulcanizing. And some here are probably plumbers that have ever used PVC uh, cement or connected PVC together. If you use that primer, the purple stuff that stains your hands, and if you drip it on the floor, it stays there for a long time. If you use that before you put the pipes together, it creates a bond that cannot be separated. It can be cut, you know, cut and cut off or cut into or cut off past that and do it again, but it can't be separated. But if you would just use the cement only, if you'd use just the cement only, you could cut through the inner or the outer part, not touch the other one, and you can use a hammer and a screwdriver or a hammer and a, a punch or chisel or something, and you can separate those two surfaces and have opportunity to sand it, redo it. What this word means is that vulcanizing to, to permanently cement together. Not, well, we'll attach it, but I might change my mind later on. But to permanently. And Paul's instruction from the Holy Spirit here is, is to cling, to cleave to that which is good. This is the good way that we're to be seeking for. Amen. This is the way that the Holy Spirit is telling us to find that good way. And if you're not sure, what are we to do? Inquire. Ask, inquire, study, read the scriptures. It's a whole other sermon, but I don't believe the word of the, I don't believe the Lord will allow a sincere, honest soul to be lost. I don't believe he will. And, and examples for that is Cornelius, the Ethiopian eunuch, and others. They were sincerely seeking the way of God. They were shown the gospel, and what did they do? They accepted it. Let those men, let these people be our examples. Cling to what is good. This is the old way. This is what this, the Holy Spirit is pointing us to. Notice as we go to 1 first, first Peter, let's stop at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22. Um, again, a, a passage that we're all familiar with. And even though it's one of the shortest passages in the Scripture, it is no less important, no less powerful, or should be no less influential in our lives. This, this Scripture teaches us, and uh, said 5 and verse 22, says, to abstain from every form of evil. Abstain from every form of evil. It doesn't even have to be, if you look at that, it doesn't even have to be evil. It can take the appearance of evil. You know, as, as, as kids, 
What did we want to do? For some dumb reason, we wanted to have that candy cigarette, right? Candy wasn't evil. But what were we trying to portray? You know, as adults, what does that morph into as we get older? You know, but that's what it, it doesn't even have to be something that is evil. If the world can look at us and think we're doing evil, we need to consider what we're doing. Amen. We need to consider that. And if we're ever, I hope if we're ever challenged by someone in the world about a practice we have because they thought maybe we were doing something wrong, I hope that'd be like that, that we would drop it. Because you profess Christ, and what happens? You're scrutinized. You know, in, a, in an old sermon, I have a bunch of old sermons from uh, Archie Word. And one of his sermons to preachers, and I like this, one of his sermons to preachers was his exhortation to them was, tell someone, tell people, everybody you're with that you're a preacher. He said, tell them. He's like, because they're going to be watching you, and it's going to help you stay, be on your best behavior. <laughs> you know? Because when people know you're a preacher, they're watching you. And they are. I can tell you that. I, I get challenged by coworkers of mine, often in a joking way. But if I come across as, as mean or rude to one of them, the response is, oh, yeah, you're awful mean for a preacher. Or, you know, and again, it, it's good hearted, but it makes me think. Was that the appropriate response? If someone even joking, you know, because what's in most jest? At least a little bit of truth, right? So we need to make sure that we are, as Brother G.J. mentioned this morning, we are God's Bible. There's uh, the song, I think it's 512, the world's Bible that's in the songbook. For many people, you are the only message they're ever going to hear or ever going to read. What is that message saying? Is that message saying that it's okay to flirt with sin? It's okay to do a little bit of this because I've got time to repent or I'll just go and, you know, I'll, I'll pray and ask God to forgive me. What is our message saying? What is our message saying? Are we remaining true? and steadfast in the word of God. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Amen. We've already mentioned this. This way is not according to our nature. We are to stay away from the desires of this flesh that war against the soul, the spirit of God that he has put in us. We are to stay away from it. You know, there in uh, Thessalonians, we could have kept reading, it says to what? Quench not the spirit. Quench not the spirit. Stay away. Abstain from those lusts that war against the soul. 1 Peter 3, turn over to chapter 3, and we'll read verses 8 through 12. 1 Peter 3, beginning with verse 8, he says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Amen. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But there's a negative. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Amen. We are to shun wickedness. We are to stay away from evil. I love the example, the testimony. And, and I, I would ask each of you, ask yourself this question. Again, here, we can examine ourselves. 
Can it be said, like it was said of Lot, that we were righteous and our righteousness caused us to be vexed by the evil that was surrounding him? Can that be said about me? Do people know that I hate evil? Do people know that you hate evil? Is it torment? It says that it tormented his righteous soul because of what he was living in. Now, we know Lot was not a perfect man. We can question his reasons for being where he was, going where he was, and on and on it was, but we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about seeking the way of God. Can it be said about you that your righteous soul is vexed by the evil we live in? The evil we live in. The absolute horrendous indecency that is portrayed in the streets around us. Are we vexed by that? The next point that we want to look at concerning the old path. This, the old path, the old way that has been from the beginning is a way of obedience to Almighty God. Obedience to His Word. When He says, stand and seek for the old paths, that consists of being obedient to the Word of God. A, lot, a word we thought we didn't have to deal with once we turned 18, right? You know, we hit 18, that word is, that's in my past. Well, if we were born again, we're back to being under someone's authority. And that involves obedience. And we see again, we see that at the start. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. You can turn there. I, I know everyone knows what that verse is. You can turn there. Or you can wait till we come back to the New Testament. Genesis 2 and verse 17. God's first instruction, or not first instruction, but his only instruction of not to Adam and Eve was, but of the tree of knowledge and of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. An instruction. God demanded obedience when? When he created mankind. He required obedience. He gave them everything. Today, you and I have an entire book of principles that we're constantly learning of, of what God expects from us. And we're constantly growing and we're struggling. They had one. Don't eat of that tree. But it was the old way still. Obedience to God's word. Obedience to his instructions. Uh, Romans chapter 5, as we move over to the New Testament. Romans 5 and verse 19. Romans chapter 5. Verse 19 says, For as by one man's obedience, for as by one man's obedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Now, in this passage, it's, it's, it's telling us about sin and death and how through Adam, as we just read, sin came. But we're looking here how God wants obedience. And what does obedience result in? All have the opportunity. To be righteous through Christ's obedience is what this verse is talking about because of his obedience for him to, willing to, to suffer and die and, and, and obey his father. We all can now through obedience be made righteous Amen. through obedience. We are made righteous. The most prevailing, the most prevailing uh, doctrine today is it's, Obedience has nothing to do with it. It's merely a profession of faith. Well, we understand from James that if there's not obedience, there isn't that faith. Amen. So obedience is God's way. That is the old way that he's uh, turned us to and desired us to follow. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10. In verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing 
that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Now I think if every believer here is honest, this is probably the hardest form of obedience for us to have, isn't it? Even our thoughts? Do we bring our thoughts into captivity? To obedience to the Word of God. Obedience to Jesus Christ. But this is the old way. And by the grace of God, through His strength, by His help, we know it can be achieved or else He would not have told us to do it. Amen. He would not have put it there for us to follow. But even our thoughts are to be obedient. And then um, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, and then we're going to talk about an example that I love in the Old Testament that, that I found several years ago. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with it, but you know the Apostle Paul um, said that it was a good thing for him, I think it was Paul, said it was a good thing for him to remind us. Yes, I wrote you guys a letter, but it's a good thing to be reminded. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 says that we are the elect of God according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit. What was the purpose of this separation that the Spirit offers? For obedience and the sprinkling or the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. That we would be obedient to His blood. You know, I, I find it necessary or, or beneficial to us to mention this today. I see more and more around us. If you want, if you would, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 13. I see more and more around us um, the idea, the thought processes of if we feel something, if we have an experience, then it is right. It is right. But I want to read this this example and let us understand that experiences feelings emotions don't make something right Amen. neither do they make something wrong you know there's a lot there's a lot of people who will refuse to do the hard thing and discipline because it doesn't feel right to them does that make it right no just like there's a lot of people who have an experience or an emotion and they base their, their soul, they base their salvation on that emotion instead of what the Word of God has to say. We're going to read verses, just, uh, just verses, um, oh, where am I at? Yeah, Deuteronomy 13, uh, 1 through 5. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether or not you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and who redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So shall you put away the evil from your midst." Notice that. Not only did he give a prophecy, but what happened? It was fulfilled. I, I don't know about you, but that's kind of an inkling for me to say, all right. But if it's contrary to the word of God, if we profess to know that we're saved because this, I prayed, I asked Christ into my heart, and I have this, this sense, this urge, this feeling... I know I was saved. What does the scripture say? It says that we're not. It says that we're not. We, we cannot trust our hearts. 
What does Jeremiah 17, 9 tell us? The heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it? Do we want to trust that heart? Or do we want to seek the word of God? Do we want to know what the word of God says? You know, in, in times past, when I've heard people recount, I've heard, you know, testimonies, you, I've heard people recount miraculous occurrences and events. And in times past, I always was like, oh, they're crazy. Couldn't have happened. But, you know, I actually don't believe that anymore. I believe. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11. What does the Apostle Paul tell us about Satan and his angels? He says Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. Why did the Apostle Paul tell us in Galatians chapter 1 that even if an angel of light appeared, not to believe him if he told us something different? You think he said something that w wasn't possible? Or that Satan couldn't manipulate into appearing to be real? Even Jesus said that there would be those who would mi work miracles in his name. But he said, depart from me, you who work iniquity who practice lawlessness. So I don't, I don't discount someone's experience. Whether it was just because of our, our human psyche and our subconscious that they experienced this, I don't know. I'm not here to judge that. We're to let the Word of God judge their experience, though. Or not their experience, but their belief. And today, it's really easy to get caught up into this, this mindset and this thought of, you know, there, there's a lot of people who seem on fire for the Lord, who put me to shame because, you know, they'll walk up to anybody. Do you know the Lord? You know, you're like, okay, a little creepy, you know. But, you know, their fervor, you know, want to pray with everybody. And, you know, it's like, wow, we should be more like that. More willing to share, more willing to evangelize. I'm guilty. There's some people I, I know and love dearly that I have a hard time. How do I broach their salvation with them? What approach should I take? You know, we want to justify it by, by well, they're reading me, right? Yep, I'm being a good example. That, that's all they got. We want to make excuses, all kinds of things. But, so we, we see someone that's on fire or something. But if it's not according to truth, we have to make sure that we are seeking the truth, that we are being obedient to the word of God, that we're following after God's word. We're allowing God's word to define truth. Amen. Then the next one is the old way, is that of love. And love, you know, there, there's a lot, there's a lot of, I think misconceptions about love, the first thing we need to understand is only God can define it. God is love. Therefore, He defines what love is. I've experienced someone after just, uh, you know, a male after just beating up his girlfriend, but then crying, I love her. It's like, do you have some affections for her? Do you have some feelings for her? Sure. Is there some emotions for her? Sure. But is it love? Not according to the Word of God, because the Word of God says what? Love doesn't do any harm. Amen. On and on it goes, right? So God is the only one who can define love, and so we need to love as God defines it. Amen. And first, we need to love the Lord our God. De Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Amen. Here's another verse to examine ourselves by. Here's a verse we can examine ourselves by. It says, you shall love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, all your might. Is that how we love the Lord our God? And then before we go to the New Testament, uh, Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19 and verse 18. And again, throughout, throughout the law, throughout the law, we can find Scripture after Scripture after Scripture telling us to love the Lord our God, um, to put no other gods before Him, and, and on and on. And uh, verse 18 here, it says, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Amen. So we see of old, God said what? Love him and love your neighbor. Love him and love mankind. And then we see Jesus in uh, Matthew chapter 22. We see here that um, it's brought over. We find it now in the New Testament. It's, you know, we, we don't say, we can't say, well, that was the Old Testament. Now it's, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a little different. In Matthew chapter 22, 37 through 39. Thus, if Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And we, we understand when he says hangs all the law and the prophets, every law that we have has to do with loving God and our neighbor in the same law or loving our neighbors. Not stealing, that's loving your neighbor. And on we can go. We don't, we're not, the point isn't to get into all of that. But understand that love, loving as God loves, loving each other with the love that Christ has for us, loving, uh, loving God with all of our fervor. We find this is why Jesus, and in, in, in especially in a family um, that is so prevalent, uh, and, and familial love and, you know, patriarchal families and so on. Love or affection for each other oftentimes takes precedence over love for Christ. That's why Jesus said, except you love me more than father and mother, brother and sister, and so on. Because we can, we can have so much affection for, for our child, which anyone that's a parent understands that propensity. We can have so much affection for them that we might be willing to change the Word of God, change our convictions, let something slip, whatever it is. We can't do that. We have to follow Christ. Because I can tell you that if we don't give, if our children stray and we stray with them, you're both lost. We're both lost. If we remain faithful, if we stick to the old paths, what do we stand a chance of? Bringing them back. But if we go with them and now we're in the mega church and now we're anything goes because of God's grace, you went along with them. You're not saving them. You don't love them. But even a worse offense, you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you didn't love him enough to be faithful. Amen. You know, the, the Ephesian church in Revelations is, uh, turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 5. This is, again, here we go examining ourselves. This is the, I think, the one that God directed at me. Because, notice what it says. It says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor. Notice, your works, your labor, your patience, 
You cannot bear those who are evil. That's what we just talked about. You have tested those that say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Let's just stop there. Sounds like if we read that, I'd, man, I'd be like, that's a congregation I wouldn't mind moving to. That's a faithful congregation. Look at, they're not weary of, of, of living right. They're not weary of, uh, you know, a false teacher comes in here, they find him out, boom, he's gone. All of these things. Unfortunately, he kept going. He said, nevertheless, less, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Amen. It doesn't say what they weren't doing. It lists what they were doing, but clearly they weren't doing it out of love for the Lord. They were lacking because their, their, their devotion, their steadfastness, their doing right, wasn't with love. Amen. Wasn't with love. And you know, those of us that were raised in the church and had godly parents, even strict parents that made us, you know, walk the straight and narrow, and maybe we just kind of transferred from being a child into the church, we need to look at ourselves. Do we truly love the Lord? Do we truly have that love? Because it, we can be like this. I can honestly say it's not a struggle for me to go to church. Always done it. Never not done it. Always have gone to church. It's not a struggle for me to tithe. I've always done it. It's just I'm used to it. Don't I don't doesn't come to my mind of wow. I I could have had five thousand more dollars this year. You know, that, that's a four-wheeler. That's whatever it is. It doesn't come to my mind. Why? Because I've always done it. We need to look. with Even when I wasn't, even when I wasn't faithful in, in my life, I, was, I never quit going to church. I was still there. Still gave my tithes. Still, you know, even if it was being faked or whatever it was. Do we truly love? And again, I encourage everyone to examine themselves. Let's not just go through the motions. The old way is loving the Lord Jesus Christ, loving God who was willing to send His Son to die on our behalf. Amen. Do we love God and His Son and His Holy Spirit? Do we truly love? This is the old path. As we bring these thoughts to a close, it is only if we choose the path that God has laid out do we receive this rest that is promised. It's only if we choose that path. You know, the, the scriptures Jesus taught of two paths, one that is broad, one that is narrow and difficult. It's only if we take that narrow path, that road, and stay on it and follow it, do we find rest. Notice Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Only if we take Jesus' yoke, His burden, the road He has chosen, His path, that is how we find the rest. If we take someone else's burden, someone else's path, 
There's not going to be rest at the end of that, regardless of how, how uh, good we do at that path, how faithful we are to that path. In the last verse we're going to read this evening, notice 2 Timothy chapter 4. Again, one that we're familiar with, but what a beautiful sentiment. And only someone who truly has faith in Christ can say this, especially as we know we might be approaching that time when we are going to give an account for ourselves. Verse 7 and 8, Paul declared this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved His appearing. Loving the Lord Jesus Christ. If we love Him according to His way, we're going to do everything else. We're going to hate sin because we love Him and He hates it. We're going to stay away from from our, our flesh. We're not going to follow our flesh because we love Him and this is what He wants. That's why when Paul summed up that with, That crown is for all who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a a, a thoughtless, mindless, I love you, that is so prevalent in this world. A young man telling a girl he he loves her just so he can ruin her life. You know, vice versa, whatever it is. It's not love. But if we truly love the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can have that rest that is promised. I want to share a song with you guys. It's going to be a new one for you, I think. 226. Uh, It's not necessarily an invitation song, but it is a song that that is titled Stand Fast in the Faith and references the verse of our text. And this evening, this evening, if there's someone who has been seeking that old way and knows they found it, Now's the opportunity. Why wait? Maybe there's someone that has known the Lord and has gotten off of that old way, but knows they need to get back to that way. We have the opportunity. When there's life, there's hope. Amen. Well, there's life, there's hope. And we pray that for all of our loved ones who are outside the Lord. Where there's life, there's hope. We have that opportunity. This, this song says to stand fast in the faith of Christ. Verse 1 says, always eager to defend. Put on the whole armor of God and having done all to stand. Amen. We'll stand and be singing. And as you see on the stands in the chorus, you'll see a little uh, arrow above it. That's an accent.